Hi, Mark. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm great. Pleasure to be here. It's a real joy to have you as well. So uh, I, I, obviously we want to hear this thing in, in just a second, though, but I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. This is a radio show. Can you describe what it looks like? Well, for people that are familiar with uh, a harmonium, which is sort of an Indian organ, um, it's basically a, a box. Yeah. And it's, it's not really specifically an instrument per se, but it's really a collection of different instruments, different sounds that I've been attracted to over the years and I've experimented with. We found a way to put it inside one box. Yeah, I see. We were just talking before. I see sort of two necks that look like they could be ukulele necks or like electric guitar or mandolin necks. I see an ebo sort of for, for playing. That, that's for playing a string without having to actually pluck the string, right? That's right. It's basically an electronic magnet. And I see something that looks like a hurdy-gurdy, like the wheel of a hurdy-gurdy on one side as well. That's right. Am I onto something here? Totally. And on the side, I see all the comments... From all the things that is that that's all the, the little sayings on the side are comments on on videos online. My, my favorite comments from YouTube. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me about the moment you came up with this instrument in your mind? Well, I was um, slated to give a master class actually at the Glen Gould Theater in a couple of weeks, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to actually show off an instrument? So I did a sort of a Homer Simpson quality sketch of what I wanted, handed it <laughs> off to my good friend, Tony Duggan-Smith, who built it for me. It arrived the morning of the master class, so I pulled it out in front of the audience, and I ha hadn't really even played it before, so it was pretty crazy of me to do that. And you've since used it, right? You've since used it in your scoring. I use it in my scoring uh, on occasion. Uh, mostly I use it for performing live. I've been doing sort of small uh, dates throughout throughout the world. Uh, so it's it's taken me places. It's been a lot of fun. Can we can we hear something? Um, uh, give me an example of the kind of sound that this thing can make that you that you love. Sure. Should I give you uh, like individual sounds and Sh tell you what? Sure. Tell you what we're hearing. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Those are the rulers. So those are, I should point out for people listening to this, that's actual metal rulers, like the kind you use in school that you bowed with what looks like a cello or a violin bow. It's actually a nickel harpa bow, but yes. And you, you're, you're manipulating those sounds through a, kind of a wall of electronics there. All right, what else, what else do we got? I'm, I'm excited to hear some more stuff. Sure. Okay, this, um, this is a, basically a, a really primitive uh, hurdy-gurdy. Um, It's really primitive. I like it because I can, I can, oh, do sort of squeaky wheels and stuff, sort of like this. Wow. The hurdy gurdy, I should mention, is, is is a folk instrument. Often, you know, you it's kind of it sounds it can sound like a bagpipe. It's, it's used a lot in a lot of French music and a lot of European music. And you can you roll a wheel and then you put your hands over it to get to to um, to make notes. I've never seen it used like that. It's never terrified me the way it did just then. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I was looking for was was really a, a primitive primordial sound. What I'm doing, where you can really hear the fingers on the on the instrument. Okay, so did you got one more for us? Sure, I got a few things. Okay. Um, this is uh, an ebo on on a single string, and it sounds like this.
So again, an ebo is a, is a sort of an, an electronic um, um, accessory that you play onto a string and it treats the the uh, good, like a, a string like a violin and it bows it. That is like a, a nonstop sound. That is amazing what you just did there. Cool, cool. I can show you some other stuff too. Show me some other stuff. I'm never, you're not getting out of here anytime <laughs> soon. You know. Absolutely. We're just terrifying the Canadian public together. This is great. All right. <laughs> so this is a spring reverb from a guitar amplifier. Okay. Um, sometimes while I'm performing, I'll give it a bang. Also, sometimes I'll play with the Ebo. And then we also have a clock spring. Okay. That sometimes I bow or just. When you play that really loud, it sounds like a, just this huge explosion. And then I have uh, a rod. A rod. That sometimes I'll play with the bow. Okay. It kind of looks like a car antenna. Bouncing yeah. up and down. I actually don't know what it is. And then I have these things. They look like lollipops. Yeah, these little, they're kind of a white stick with a, a little orange ball on top of it. It looks like a lollipop. That's right, that's right. Um, and they're little, little friction mallets, actually. potential for uh, scary sounds. Mark, that's that's really amazing. Thank you so much for bringing in the, the, uh, the apprehension engine. You're welcome. I mean, this might seem like a very basic question, but like, do these ideas for sounds just appear to you when you're sitting down watching television? Like, where, where, where do you get the ideas for these really novel ways of playing these instruments? I just, I just play and experiment. Um, I think a real advantage I have is I get bored really, really easily. <laughs> so when I'm, when I'm sitting down and playing with this, um, I'll, I'll go, how can I make a sound that I've never made before? And, and it's so tactile. It's, you, you just move your fingers in a certain way to create a new sound that you've never heard before. And maybe this is like the old folky in me here, but I love how analog it is. Like, are these instruments, these sounds that, that are kind of exist only in an analog form, they'd be harder to make digitally? Oh yeah, very much, very much so. That was, that was the whole, uh, whole appeal because as a composer, you're basically behind uh, a workstation all day. You're basically, you look like an accountant or something. <laughs> and uh, like a lot of us, you get tired of, of that after a while. And you want to get out and you want to start sort of touching real wood and feel the instrument resonate underneath your fingers. It's good for the soul. If you're just tuning in, my guest today is Mark Corvin, an award-winning composer who's created this incredible machine that makes incredibly scary sounds called the Apprehension Engine. So you grew up in Alberta? No, actually, I grew up in uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg, Manitoba. That's right. Winterpeg. Yes. I call it that, right. So w were you always interested in, in uh, experimental sound, in, in, in this kind of thing, experimental composition? Not really. I was more of a straight-ahead rock and roller who got involved in jazz, um, you know, progressive, progressive rock. I was a singer-songwriter for, for many years. Um, and then once I started scoring films, at, at that point I started uh, doing more experimental stuff. It, it, was it about being like, um, did, did you enjoy particularly the scoring, uh, like being able to be scary and, and do horror kind of scoring? Oh, who doesn't? It's, um, it, it's, it's basically you have almost carte blanche to do whatever you want sonically. And the weirder you can be, uh, the more you're rewarded for it. And, and that's really fantastic. So let's talk about this new film, The Lighthouse. Is the apprehension engine been used in the scoring of The Lighthouse? A, a little bit in it. I Yeah, just accents now and then. But the, the Lighthouse score is primarily a brass score. So when I was watching the film, and I should point out that... Um, uh, the, the film is starring Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. If you haven't seen it, they're on this kind of rocky island. They're in very, very close quarters. 
And it's sometimes not a lot is happening. They're just kind of sitting down, eating dinner. They're staring at one another. And the music itself is, is, is the source of a lot of the tension. What, what, what was the feeling you were going after in the music for that film? We were looking for a very primordial sound, which really depicted the, the elements in this story. The, 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 the waves, the surf, the wind, the creaking of this, of this old building. We, we were trying to find another layer to express that. Uh, um, Rob and I deliberately, we wanted to stay away from anything that would be at all considered period music or conventional film music. We really wanted to get to the, the heart of this savage environment that they, these men were trapped in. And how, how manipulative, and I know that's maybe a bit of a loaded word, can you be with music in this case? Are you able to watch a film and kind of go like, I know, I want them to jump right here, so I'm going to play this note right here. Or I want them to be stressed out, so I'm going to play this note right here. Well, th- that's a very good question. Um, some, sometimes you're, you're called on to be very mani- manipulative. Um, when I'm working with Rob Eggers, it's, it's more about the m- general mood and, and atmosphere. So there's not a lot of manipulation. It's, it's more about music as another character in, in the story, I would say. If you're just uh, tuning in, I'm speaking with Mark Corvin. So we've been talking about your work on The Lighthouse, but you've scored dozens of other films and TV shows, including the horror film from 97, Cube, The Twilight Zone, and The Witch. Um, I, I, this, is it important to you that you find a sound that's certainly scary and, and perhaps a bit off-putting, but is also original to you? Well, I think that's what it's all about for me, is is looking for those original sounds that that no one has, has heard before because, you know, if you're not doing that, what's, what's, what's the point? And how is the, how is the state of horror movies scoring right now? Like, do you, is, is there a lot of analog instruments like this still happening? I think it's, it's changing. Um, over, over the last, uh, over the last 10 years, musicians have got, gotten a lot more experimental and all the time I hear of horror film composers that are starting to dabble with acoustic instruments and, and bring it into their their score. So it's it's very refreshing because horror, horror uh, scoring and horror films, they're just so fraught with cliches. Um, and it's nice to see people wanting to stretch beyond that. I wouldn't be surprised if you start getting phone calls for people who want to buy that thing off you and, and use it themselves. Well, actually, uh, my friend Tony has already sold quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a couple of apprehension engines going around. There. Uh, there's about 12 going around right now, yes. Are we more scared by things we know or things we don't know when it comes to music, when it comes to sound? Uh, oh, absolutely. If it's, if it's unfamiliar to you, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of the essence of, of horror. Uh, it's fear of the unknown. And in my case, it's fear of sonic strangeness. So speaking of sonic strangeness, uh, thank you so much for ch- ch- chatting with us. Before you go, can you, can you play us something else before you go? Sure. I think you've done your job. I am absolutely terrified. (laughs) I'm absolutely unsettled. Mark Corbin, so nice to meet you.